This is Tanya Pearson interviewing Gail Ann Dorsey on July 20th, 2016 in Boston, Massachusetts for the Women of Rock Oral History Project. Thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure. While you're on tour. Yeah. Um, so I think I said in the email, it's like a personal and professional biography mm -hmm. because I'm interested in, you know, women as individuals. and Absolutely. So if you could talk a little bit about your childhood, your family of origin. I know you grew up in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of kid were you? What was your relationship <laughs> like with your parents? Do you have siblings? <laughs> Anything that you think is pertinent? Uh, wow. Yeah. Gosh, so funny. I don't even think that far back anymore these days. Um, uh, yeah, I grew up in Philadelphia. I was the youngest of five kids. I have uh, an older sister and three older brothers, now only two. I lost my oldest brother in uh, about 12 years. No, gosh, in 2000, 2000? Yeah, 2001. I can't even remember, but sometime around then. Uh, but so I was the youngest of five uh, kids, mm -hmm. and I was the what they called the surprise. Uh, <laughs> my mother had me when she was 41, which in 1962 was not that common. Mm -hmm. Now it's kind of <laughs> a lot of women having their first baby at 41, um, or in their 40s. So I was kind of like, you know, the the you know, straggler there, kind of bringing up the rear. And I grew up at a time when Philly was like, well, just in, in, for me musically, um, Philly couldn't have been a better place to, to have a childhood in, in, the early, in the late 60s and early 70, 70s. Um, uh, gosh, what kind of kid was I? I was, a, I was a creative kid from the beginning. I mean, I always knew I knew, like, I knew from the time I could be aware of my consciousness as a human being that I wanted to to make music, mm -hmm. like I, something I had to have something to do with music. Having older siblings, they, they it was a musical household in terms of listening to music. Um, a couple of my, my one of my one of my brothers and my sister they took music lessons in school. It was my sister played the violin for a minute. And uh, my brother played a little bit of upright bass. He tried and congas and just kind of had his hand in a few things. And he still plays, one of my, my middle brother, who is now my oldest brother. Um, so there was, but they were never really good at it, but they, you know, were enthusiastic. And so there was always music playing. We were always listening to music, the radio and records. And I inherited a, a, a lot of my uh, older siblings' uh, music collection and also were, was influenced, influenced by that. But uh, I just knew from hearing music that it was a, to me it was like this, it was like a language, another language which is what it is in a way. And I just knew that I had to learn how to communicate that way because I understood that language better than word, like just normal language. Like it spoke to me, even like, like I can remember as a five-year-old, like emotionally on that level, that I was like, I meant I have to learn how to do that because otherwise I won't be able to express myself if I can't speak in that way uh, initially through the guitar but also with singing, like the guitar I was so intrigued with when I heard, first heard um, Eric Clapton's solos on Cream records and, um, and, and Jimi Hendrix. And that was the cool thing as well about music at that time, certainly growing up in an uh, African-American neighborhood in a black neighborhood in the 60s. And it's like the music was, we listened, my, at least my brothers and sisters listened to everything and all the kids, like, you know, we listened to rock-based kind of stuff as long as it was, you know, Earth, Wind and & Fire. I mean, that music was, it was so diverse. Yeah. And so, you know, I was exposed to Cream and, and, you know, rock bands from England and the Stones and all that we listened to as well as Earth, Wind & Fire or, or Frankie Beverly and Mays and the soul music that was coming from, from the, all the Gamble and Huff music. It was so much great uh, music and particularly for some reason the guitar really spoke to me uh, hearing electric guitar solos and uh, and also acoustic guitar hearing Joni Mitchell and you know, all of that stuff so I, I was just I don't know I, I, I was I knew from a, a really early age that I had this was what I was gonna do I could I, there was no question 
What kind of student were you academically? Like I, was you? A, I was a good student, a straight-A student. Okay. And were your parents... Except for math. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Except for math. I'm terrible with numbers. Yeah. Terrible. I'm um, kind of dyslexic. Were your parents supportive of your like creative pursuits? My father passed away when I was six, and my mother never remarried. And I st I lived at home inf until I was seventeen. I left home. Uh, I graduated, or my birthday falls at the end of the year, or whatever. So my I was seventeen when I graduated, and 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 went on to California to film school, actually. <laughs> but um, uh, my mother was very, everyone was supportive, really. My mother was very supportive. And it was kind of an interesting thing because I look back on it, and she's passed away now, it's been five years. She was born in Virginia in 1921. Mm -hmm. And I can't even begin to imagine what it was like for her in this country <laughs> growing up as a black person in that in that time frame. And it was something that she didn't discuss very often, so we never had an in-depth com conversation about it. But there were some stories that I'd heard that were not very pleasant, and I had a few of my own. But she grew up at a time, you know, a, just a, a Baptist, you know, woman, no no creative kind of background or interest or whatever, Could, couldn't hold a tune to save her life, was, <laughs> couldn't, had no rhythm, and it was so funny. But she, and didn't understand really my world of like music and wanting to be, and being different and shaving my head and doing all these different things that I was just kind of a little fearless in doing. And always being, I was always different. Like that was the one kid on the, on the block that was, the oddball. I would. I I'd wear strange, like strange clothes, and you know, and uh, I was always the one. Oh, okay, there she is. And so, for my mother, in some ways, I was an embarrassment in that way because she just wanted me to be normal, like my sister, who was the perfect, normal girl. She, you know, she had straight hair and the, you know, going to dresses and the whole thing. So, um, my mother didn't understand, you know, why I was different and there was nothing that would change there was nothing that was t putting me back on the track of a no just a normal girl with no ambitions or any you know no just you know you know a normal teenage girl or a young girl or whatever but for some reason like looking back on it now i realize she she went out of her way to make sure i had whatever i needed to create yeah. And, it, and even though it's almost like her words would say, you know, why don't you, or why can't you be like, or I can't, why, why do you need more guitar strings? Why do you need more <laughs> film for your camera? Why, do, you know, on the one hand she'd be saying that, and on the other hand she'd be taking a job with the neighbor to go and wait uh, to, to work a party in the suburbs for a wealthy, you know, white family to make a little extra money because we lived on Social Security, my mother and I, from, from my father. We had no money, really. Uh, she, uh, she would do that to have that extra money to give me something that I needed to get a guitar or to put a down payment on an amplifier or to do... So it's like the words would say, I don't get it, you know, but the actions would be always, like, it's almost like she couldn't help it. Yeah. And so, like, I look back on that now, and it's, it's quite deep, you know. I just think, wow, there was some connection. And um, l later on in her life, I guess it's, I just realized I had the blessing to, to, by mistake in some ways, realize exactly how proud she was of me. Like, but it was never sort of, it, was, it wasn't said. It wasn't like, oh, I'm so proud of my, you know, it was just, she was always there. Yeah. She never, ever missed one single gig I ever played in Philadelphia in my entire life, from since I was 14 when I first started playing with local bands until she passed away. Like she, she saw the last show I did with a singer-songwriter named Susan Werner mm -hmm. at the World Cafe. Oh, wow. And that, would have, that was like in, I think, March or something of that year, and she passed away in June. So she saw every, you know, Everything, no matter what it was, even if it wasn't, you know, 
from every Bowie gig, every like just everything. She has been at every single so one. Like supportive she, in her actions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So maybe not. At, at, at eighty, so like eighty something years old, she's at Gwen Stefani in the yeah. middle of middle of a bunch of tiny little screaming girls, and there's my mom. She's like, <laughs> Hollaback girl, whatever, you know. <laughs> but that's my daughter up there. So she, she was so yeah. My mother was extremely supportive, and I and I'm lucky. It was like, a, you know, it's like somehow the universe put me obviously in the right environment, even though it was also traumatic in some ways, because I was different and felt like, you know, I was always kind of, you know, trying to fit in or just like, why couldn't I have more people like me? I want more of the same with me. Why am I always the one that's odd or outspoken or dressing funny or something? So there was like the anxiety of that, but at the same time, I, I just knew that I was on the path that I was meant to be on, and I seemed to have the best support system. So I, I was very lucky. I know I'm very fortunate. Um, you started playing guitar at nine, mm -hmm. and you switched to bass at some point. And I did read that Anne and Nancy Wilson <laughs> yes. part yeah. were, you know, like you mentioned, Grand Funk Railroad. And yeah, all the Grand influences Funk. Absolutely. That but that Ann and Nancy Wilson went to see Hart, and yeah. they were the ones that made you think, oh, I can do this. Absolutely. Too, so. Yeah, well, they were the first women who, well, you know, they were, you know, I since discovered, and I don't even know how I could have missed Fanny, who were incredible mm -hmm. musicians. Like, like if I had, I don't know how, in fact, Bowie was the one who told me about them, and then I went back and rediscovered them, and I'm friends with June and Jean. And, and, as, yeah, yeah, and, uh, you know, it's amazing. But in, for me, I, it was Hart that I first saw in terms of, you know, I love the music, and then, you know, I saw them on TV, and I was like, Look, there's a woman with an electric guitar. Like it wasn't just, uh, you know, it wasn't uh, a Joni Mitchell or you know one of the singer-songwriter or Dolly Parton or something with an acoustic guitar. It was like, it was, you know, rock and hard, and they, it was their band, and the guys played for them, which yeah. I thought was really cool. I was like, it's about the sisters, really. These uh, women are rocking, and and Anne's voice and just everything. And I liked rock music a lot at that time, and. and and I just thought, wow, I can do this now. Like that's given me the okay that I'm not gonna, like I can continue to try to do this because that was my vision. I was like, I wanna be in a rock band and I wanna get up there and you know, play the guitar and be respected, you know, not just be like, like be able to do what the guys can do to, to express myself, to play you know, guitar really well. And there was Nancy doing that, playing acoustic and electric guitar. And not, you know, in a very timid way, like she was out there, you know, going to town. How did you town. start, play, you said that you were playing gigs at 14? In yeah, it was, well, that was when I first started uh, playing bass. Uh, I went to, uh, I wanted to, I had already had a little band with the guys across the street. There's some kids from school, two guys from school. Yeah. And uh, they, uh, you know, I don't know if they were as serious as I was. But I really wanted to, in the summer break, I really wanted to make money uh, so I could have some money in the summer instead of doing a, working in a clothes shop or something. And I, th I wondered if, I could, if there were bands, I knew there were bands that could uh, you know, make money, like playing top 40 gigs mm -hmm. and stuff, because I'd go to the music store, the Sam Goody uh, on Chestnut Street in Philly, and we'd, there was a bulletin board and everybody, everyone would put their three by five cards up and say, you know, bass player one. And there was no, no internet. How wonderful, <laughs> how wonderful. Anymore. Oh, it was a good time. Pen and paper, I love it. And, the, and uh, you would see all these ads, you know, and I would look, you know, go just to look at the ads and go, wow, I could maybe join one of these bands. So I decided to try and uh, join a band, see if I was good enough to play guitar in somebody's band and make some money in the summer. And I, the, the thing I noticed was that I'd say 90% of the, of the cards on the board s said, guitarist seeks bass player, guitarist seeks drummer, guitarist looking for keyboard player, guitarist wants another guitarist. It was just, I mean, uh, you know, just, well, actually, everybody played the guitar. And no one, <laughs> and no one not enough people obviously played bass or drums or keyboards or anything like that. So I thought, I'm never going to be able to get a, a job as a guitar player. So I thought, 
maybe I'll try the bass, just try it, because it can't be, I had already kind of fooled around with the bass player that I had the band with, the little kids across the street, because we would rehearse in my mother's basement. So they would leave their equipment there, and when they go home, I'd go downstairs at night, and I would play the drums, and I'd play the bass, and I'd just sort of play around with everything. So I, uh, <laughs> I came back, and I said to my mother, I need to get a bass, I think. And she's like, oh, no, <laughs> come on now, you don't even play the bass. I said, well, if I'm going to get a job, I need, I'm going to need a bass. And so she said, well, get the job first, and then we'll see about the bass. So I borrowed a bass from my sister's best friend's boyfriend, who was a bass player. And he had a Rickenbacker, I'll never forget it, which is not an easy bass to play. I don't even own one now, what, what Paul McCartney played one of those. Oh, really? Uh, at one point. Uh, and I borrowed this bass and I went to an audition to a phone number that was as close to my my phone number so I knew it was in my neighborhood yes. because my mother was concerned and I went along with my sister's best friend. She actually went with me because I'm, you know, I'm 14, I'm going to some stranger's house. To, so we go and I meet who, a, a guy named Jay Medley who to this day is one of my dearest friends to this day. And uh, he he hired me for his top 40 band wow. as a bass player. I got the job. I remember auditioning in, in his basement. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, you got the job. And um, we had a bunch of gigs that summer playing, some in the club and some were. I worked with him for a, f a couple of years. And some in, uh, you know, like, a sweet 16 party on a boat <laughs> on Penn's Landing or something, you know, we played one of those. My mother came to all those cases. <laughs> she has never missed it. She was right there just in the corner with a little handbag. But, uh, so that was, the, and I got the job, so I came back and said, I got the job, so she got me a bass. I had, so I got my first bass at 14. And I played with him and, you know, we, we uh, made some money that summer. It was, it was great. Um, yeah. I found this very surprising. Um, you're a self-taught musician. Absolutely. I, have, I didn't have any music. We had music in school in those days, mm -hmm. and I did take the clarinet in school. But it's kind of odd because I can kind of read music a little bit on the clarinet because that's how it started. It was like this thing. You, they gave us the instrument, and then you start with these notes, and and I can associate the clarinet to the notes of the music, but I can't do it on any other instrument very well because <laughs> I learned them the other way, just kind of by ear and forms. I learn like the shapes, and I into I just know what the steps are, and this I can sing it. I was singing as well. We never really talked about it. I was singing like when I was five as well. So all the time that I was playing guitar and learning guitar, I was always singing and singing mm -hmm. songs and trying to start writing songs and everything. So like if I can sing it in my head, I can, I know what it's, I hear, I know what the note will sound like at that point yeah. on the guitar. Like I just, I don't know. It's a weird kind of way of, that I taught myself to figure out how to, how to speak on the instrument. Yeah. Uh, so I had some lessons like what they give you in school, what they what they were offering in school, was, and like in uh, grade school, not in like college or anything. And I I didn't have any like Jay, my friend, the guitar player who hired me. You know, his him and all his siblings had studied music. I used to be jealous of them <clears throat> because their parents could afford to have yeah. private lessons. And he was really good. He could play all this really cool shit on the guitar. Was like, you know, everything. He was like, I was like, wow, gosh, I wish I could have a teacher. But And Jay taught me a lot. He actually was the first person to teach me at least the name of the notes on the neck. I never even knew yeah. what the names were. And 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 uh, how to tune and everything properly without the tuning pitch and stuff like how to do the fifths and stuff and whatever that means. I still don't even know what those things mean. <laughs> but um, and you know, so he taught me some things. And, and along the way of my whole musical career, working with people who were as good as Jay or better and better and better and better, they all teach me little things. Like I I pick up things from them. I should say, and if I have a question, I can ask and sometimes it can be explained and I can understand, but a lot of times it, I can't. I take a, 
I've taken lessons now. I've been taking these online lessons at Berkeley here in Boston. They oh, offer wow. them online, so when I'm on tour, I take a 12-week course, and so I'm working in my hotel room and taking guitar courses, actually, not bass. And it's so weird because I still can't 100% associate it to, like, reading and, like, theory and, and uh, you know, the, the, the whole, like, academic part of it I still can't that's quite the math. I can't the math yeah the math and that, yeah and it just doesn't work it never completely clicks so that I can actually use it so that in my mind it can go okay and I'm gonna go to the fifth or the dun, dun, and then I'll know I just don't know how I, I can't, can't believe Gail Ann Dorsey takes online music <laughs> I do <laughs> it's fun <laughs> It's really fun. I've taken three of them so yeah. far from Berkeley. I was thinking of trying to, if I had time, I don't have time, I was going to go over there and see if I could actually meet one of the teachers in person because <laughs> yeah. we, we do these video classes once a week. It's hilarious. That's crazy. <laughs> um, okay, well, I know we, we only have a certain amount of time, so I don't want to go sorry. too fast. If I miss something important, Yeah, no, it's fine. You know. okay. Oh, I, I have, you know, I have some time. Um, okay, so you went to... Uh, you went to school and received a scholarship to attend California Institute of the Arts and Film. You were the only female and the youngest female to be admitted. Um, time, but can you yeah. talk about your interest in, in film and why you chose yeah. to pursue that in well, college? I don't know. It was, I was always a big move. I love. I still love it. I, I was a TV addict in the '70s. You know, like my my best friend and I, we would watch The Bionic Woman and try all those just all those great shows that, that are really funny now when you think about it. But um, so I was into TV, but I was I don't know. I was also into cinema. I think it was a. I wonder why sometimes, in terms of what what really like pulled me like that where I felt I had a connection to that almost as strong as music. Mm -hmm. I did a little bit of acting in school. I was in the in, in high school. I was involved in drama and uh, and I enjoyed that. But I also but I like the idea of I think it was the writing thing. It's like I like writing songs but I also like writing, like just creative writing. I used to get awards at creative writing when in like elementary school. I still have these little plaques. You know, I would always win the creative writing contests or whatever because I, lo I love words and writing and I like, I like typewriters. I collect old typewriters now. It's my one hobby and it's like, um, I think what I liked about movies were, were just the, sto the telling of the story, like the, how amazing it was to sort of be able to v visually recreate a story, something was from a book. Because my main interest in it was to be a screenwriter, mm -hmm. not particularly to direct. I would love to direct a movie, but screenwriting was my number one kind of interest. And that's what I got the scholarship for. It was for my writing. Oh, right. I did some Super 8 films, so they knew I had the ability to like edit, and I understood, you know, the, you know, composition and those things. But it was like the fact that I had written like a couple of full-length screenplays at 17, and one of them, one, you know, was I guess kind of, I think a little bit adult or whatever, and they were like, "Wow, this is impressive. There's a, you know, there's some potential here." So. Um, I, I went that way, but also what I liked ab about film was that it, it, it had all of the elements. It had music as well. So I, I would write these stories sometimes when I was young, like smaller films, and I would write a whole like soundtrack to go with the film. Yeah. And then I would like draw like the poster for the movie and everything. I had all, used to do because I, I liked to draw as well. All the uh, art things yeah. I was kind of like, as, especially as a kid, now I don't do all of those things. I don't have time. <laughs> but you know, somehow I had a lot of time as a kid to just like just do all that. You know, like I just went, okay, I'm gonna write now, and then I'm gonna paint something, and then we're gonna go to rehearsal, and it was just great. That was, I have to say, that's the the most brilliant thing about having had the chance to work with David Bowie, because that's what he is. Like he embodies that in every way. He was an artist in every genre, and he was brilliant at absolutely everything. And he had that way of, I don't know. So when you worked with him on a particular tour or project, you were kind of, it was like I was living that yeah. childhood thing, but it, like what I always, I had 
find, like reach something that I really aspired to. I was like, wow, it's like there's art going, there's costumes and staging and there's music and there's, you know, there's lyric things and there are just all kinds of stuff. But it would be great like to work on things with him. So I was kind of, you know, I was doing all those things when I was young. And so film, I just, I thought it would be fun to study that at school because I didn't want to go to music college because I had no prior training. So I thought I'm going to go to a music college, and there are people who have already had lessons, and maybe have some. And I can, and I just don't get this yeah. music reading thing, and all this. You know, I just couldn't grasp it. So I thought it would be really frustrating to go to to music university. Now is different. Like I said, I do it. I like, now I really want to like do it because mm -hmm. there's no. It's just for my own, you know, whatever. It'll yeah. maybe it'll click one day, maybe it won't. But at the time, it was like I had a mission to do something, so I wanted to be sure I made the right choices. And uh, so I I took I chose film, and um, and then I realized when I got to film school, there was a like, and also my first time away from home, my first time on a plane, my first time out of Philly, like far away, and. And growing up now, I'm old, I got to take care of myself. I'm, I'm 18, but you know, I realized that you know, in the world there are temperaments. There are certain, well, certainly in entertainment industry in different different forms now that I've worked in. In the film industry, at least it was when I first started. When I went to college, rather, filmmakers. I noticed, <laughs> and I, I'm just generalizing, so I won't say it's all filmmakers, but filmmakers have a, a, you have to have a do or die, like to get something done, to actually get a film made from start to finish, you know, and really, and all the people involved and everything, and money and time and equipment and all those things, you have to be willing to like roll over somebody with a steamroller if it takes it like if whatever it takes <laughs> you got to get and I don't have that personality and I watched every all the people around me who were able to get anything done and they would you know they would sell their mother to get a what you know whatever I'm not I'm you know not to be but you know what I mean it's like a, it's just a and I just thought I can't I can't do that so you lasted, what was it, three semesters? Three, like there? a year and a half, yeah, yeah a year okay. and a half. And um, did, did part of you leaving, well, I noticed that when I saw you went to film school mm. and that you were like the only woman and the youngest woman. Yeah, said, then. Man, so she chosen two very like male-dominated oh, career paths. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, still, but, both of them still are, but, yeah. but now it's, I would imagine if you went to any film school freshman year now, it'd be loads of, it'd be half women. Yeah. You know, no problem. But then it was just a kind of, for some reason, it was yeah. definitely male. Down, you know, there were hardly any female directors, and the, there were probably none in the Directors Guild at that point. Mm -hmm. This is 1980, 1979, yeah. maybe one, <laughs> mm -hmm. if that, you know. Um, you moved to London, mm -hmm. and I just like to fill in the, the gap the cats. because it seems like. When yeah. Sometimes when you hear artist stories or about how they get their first break, it's not mm -hmm. like a, you know, it just, I was reading a little bit about you and it says you left school, moved to London. Yeah, I went to New York first. Boy George. Yeah. yeah. But I was like, wait, mm -hmm. how did she get from mm -hmm. dropping out of film school to like, being a session musician with all the people. <laughs> yeah, yeah like, right. Yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> a lot happened in between. No, I had, I'd met a friend in school, uh, in college, who was, who was from London. He was in the, um, the art department, like uh, graphic design and that kind of stuff. And both of us had played music when we were young, when we were kids. He was a, he was like a classical piano player. This guy could, you know, and we, you know, a lot of people who were in other schools were musicians as well at some point. And we would kind of meet up in the cafe at Mom's. It was called Mom's Cafe at CalArts, a very famous hangout. And there was a piano there, and people would play music and and hang out and. And so you discovered who the musicians were, and I went to a swap meet. I didn't even go with a guitar. I was so determined I was going to be a screenwriter, and I was going to like just write movies and you know maybe direct. And but I, I was like two two or three weeks later, I was like, if I don't get a guitar, I'm going to die. <laughs> so I went to a swap meet, and I bought a thirty dollar guitar at the Saugus. Sa I forget the Saugus. I think it was called this weird town up there. Uh, swap meet, and I got a, a little 
nylon string guitar, so I had something. So I would go to mom's with my guitar and jam with everybody. But my friend from London, we, we left school at the same time. We both decided we wanted to go back to music. I decided when I realized I didn't have the temperament for movies, that was the decision to leave school because I thought, I'm not going to be that person. I can't be that person. Mm -hmm. and, and, I want, and screenwriting is the hardest of all with film for me because you, you spend an, a year or whatever working on a story or working on a script, and it takes forever to see this thing. You're sitting there at the typewriter for hours, and you see it all coming to life, and you're writing this story, and you're like, oh, my God, and you're going, this actor's going to play it, and you're going to light the costume. You can see everything. And then you have to hand it over, and someone has to make that happen. And it could take forever. And I just thought, I can't wait that long for to see it, like for it to come back to me. And I thought... Music, the beauty of music, especially live music, which has been the predominant of my career. I've done a bunch of records, but not as many as some people. But touring is just is bliss to get on a stage and just play, and you have the audience. It's instant. It's happening at the moment. There's that's it. It's like that's you. You know, so you're not waiting for. So you know, you're waiting to get onto the stage next. That's all. You know, it's like I remember working for Charlie Watts and him. I think he said this in an article somewhere, but he said it to me one day. It's like, he's like, well, music business is just. You know, he said I've been 25 years waiting around and and about yeah. one year actually playing music. Yeah. <laughs> you're waiting around to play. You're traveling. You're in a hotel. You're whatever. And then there's that hour on stage when it's you know, and he was right. So. But, but the, that moment, like I thought music is more instantaneous and, and I can get a, a response right away from my efforts. And, mm -hmm. and screenwriting is something I can do when I'm 65 or 70 years old if I really want to and, I, and who cares at that point. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, so um, that was my decision to leave school. And then I went to New York to start a band again, to get back into the music thing. And I worked in record stores. I worked in... Um, like a little independent record store on 8th Street, which is now full of shoes and nothing else. There's no more record stores. And then I moved up to Sam Goody that was on the corner of 51st and 6th Avenue, which is the corner opposite Radio City Music Hall. And I remember sitting at the till, the cash register, the whole time, uh, <clears throat> going to work every day for minimum wage. Um, and trying to write songs and find other musicians and get a band and get a record deal. That was the new thing. And, okay, now we go for the record deal. Um, I just would look out at Radio City every day. From the, I could see the awning from the store, and I would think, one day I've got to play Radio City. I've got to play Radio City. And I remember it, it was 1992, the first time I ever played Radio City, the Gang of Four. Strange. Yeah. On a strange tour, but, but then I played maybe three or four times since then. But, and Sam, Sam Goody is long gone, that record store is, <laughs> no, it's a bank or something now. Uh, but I, I spent a year, about a year and a half in New York at that point before going to London. And I just was working, you know, minimum wage job and going from sublet to sublet and kind of crashing. I was with my friend from London. He was there as well. We were trying to do something together and then I would work with other people. We were just trying to get music going again. And then he had to go home because he, he had no student visa anymore, really, and it was time for him to go home. And so I was like, well, I've got nothing going on here. Maybe I can go back to London and see, just see what it's like in London. And that was, that's how I got there. And I, I lived with his family and, and kind of got acquainted with things. And it was just like, it was like the right place at the right time. I don't know how, somehow I landed there and I started to meet people and they would go, hey, we got this pub gig. Uh, pubs were huge in terms of music in 1983 in London. I have no idea what it's like now. But, and if, if you've ever been to London or even seen a movie about London or anything, there's a pub on every freaking yeah. corner that you <laughs> of the whole city. No matter, where, and every, just about at that time, nearly every pub had live music. And they, some of them still do. I, I, when I go back, I, there's music there's, on certain nights. And so I, I kind of met these musicians who were playing kind of jazz stuff. And I was like, I never played jazz, but I could, you know, I could just figure out how to walk around on the bass. But I really knew no theory. I didn't yeah. know, really didn't know. Like, that's, 
way out of my I element. Know, just figure out how to play jazz. Well, <laughs> but I did, but I kind of did in a way. I kind of found a, a way to do it that made people think I knew what I was doing. Maybe that's what I've done my whole career. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes I think that <laughs> I just think I don't know what I'm doing. I don't even I don't know how I can even do it. I still to this day. I just think I'm just happy I learned that language, like I said, we're talking about, because otherwise I don't know that I just would, I'd be mute, like emotionally, like mute. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to just, like, I don't know, exist, I don't think, in the world if I couldn't speak the language of music. But um, I just figured that out, and, I, and people were saying, well, we got this little gig at a pub here, and a pub here, and a pub there. And before I knew it, it was the first time I was able to kind of make a living playing music, like, mm -hmm. The, these pub gigs could really bring in enough money to get through your little, what you needed. You know, I wasn't living high on the hog. I was living in a house with like five other people and, you know, she, you know I was 21 years old or something. You know, I didn't, I didn't have anything to, uh, you know, uphold or whatever. I just needed to get from day to day. And then, you know, one thing just led to the next. It really was, I just felt, I just fell into London at the right time and then I was able to get work and, get permission to work and just it was amazing really really amazing um, were there other women doing it at the time mm -hmm. other african-american women or? uh not african-american women that i can think of not in london i was working i was working with a lot of female musicians but they were all white musicians they were from different some were english some were australian uh, uh, <clears throat> not in terms of uh there were singers mm -hmm. There were maybe some not like percussionists, not yeah. many bass players at all, actually fairly, not, and I think that out, that worked to my advantage mm -hmm. in, in London. It did, like, this was difficult in the United States, was very difficult because I have never really, my own music that I've written, uh, I've ne it's never been particularly R&B music or urban music or black, what they call black music. Yeah or whatever you call it, I don't know, so many names now for stuff. Uh, <laughs> but when I, and when I presented my music in the States, especially after I'd already done an album in London and then they, had to, they were going to release it in the United States, was a really good example, but it was something I had faced in America before I even went to London, is that it was really, if you were black, it, or African American or whatever, you were expected to play that a particular kind of music, yeah. uh, and I just didn't fit in that mold. And so, so the people that I loved, like like Hendrix, or especially Grace, at that point, Grace Jones was like my mm -hmm. idol, because I thought, well, she's the only one, the only one who seems to be able to be a black female, African American female or actually she's Jamaican, I think, or whatever, initially, and be able to be an artist, just yeah. be, do, do something completely different. And the only way she's able to do this is that she's working with people from France. It's the same story as, what's her name? Um, what's the famous? Josephine Baker from oh, the right. 20s or whatever, yeah. whenever it was she went to France. And so it was a similar situation being in London for me. I could do, uh, there were artists, there were, uh, black artists who were could be from Germany or wherever they were from, and they they were playing all kinds of music, but no one mentioned the fact that they were black ever. It was, it was never an issue. It was only like, do you like what this band is doing, or this singer is doing, or this artist is doing, or not? Either you like it or you don't like it. It yeah. wasn't any. It didn't fit into any particular thing. It was like this is the cool song right now, yeah. which reminded me of the '70s in a way, because it was the same way. It was like this was the the you know, it was Earth, Wind & Fire right next to, you know, next to Grand Funk, mm -hmm. you know, where an American band could be playing and then next would be the, you know, Serpentine Fire. It didn't make any difference. They were both amazing songs, so you didn't really care who was playing it or what color they were or whatever. So London was offered me that as well. Like I could just, they were accepted my music and they liked what I was doing and they would, could see what I was able to do and, and just looking at you as an artist. Um, but there weren't, but as a session player, yeah, there weren't many females, period, let alone black females playing bass. There are plenty now, which I'm very happy about. I yeah. sort of feel like I, I hope I helped to kind of, you know, 
open the doors for that. I really do because you know I do know how hard it is. You know. Um, so you recorded Corporate World while you were in London. Yes. And so that was uh, that was a major. It was Warner. Warner Brothers. Warner yeah. Brothers, mm -hmm. But that was like the London Warner Brothers or the London Warner okay. Brothers. I was signed in London. Yeah. And um, the record was what made was there. What was your experience working with a major label at that time? Terrifying. Yeah. And uh, uh, a little bit um, disappointing. Um, uh, it was, it was, uh, and working, uh, intimidating, that's the word I want to say. It was a little bit intimidating as well, like more than I expected it to be. I thought maybe I would be stronger and more in control, but I think the stakes are high, and then you suddenly got a bunch of money, which is weird, and then you've got all this other stuff, and press and all, you know, it's, it's exciting at the same time. But again, I think you have to be, I don't know, not ready for it, but yeah, I guess you have to be ready for it. Or, or ha again, there was a, a, a thing of knowing like a, a sort of temperament that you have to have in that level of music. It's different than playing in pubs or, or doing, you know, workshop things or whatever, you, you know, different stuff. Um, so, uh, I, yeah, it was it was kind of intimidating, and I had a, it was for hard making the record too. I, I'm I'm very proud of it. I'm still very proud of the songs mm -hmm. for sure. I think they it's still really I think they still it's, hold up, yeah. and I think I was on to something when I was talking about the corporate world a long long time yeah. ago because it is that is exactly what we're living and we were living it then, but now it's it's worse than ever. Yeah. But. Um, I think I, you know, even just working with a producer, with Nathan East, who produced it, who was a bass player, who was one of my bass heroes for, for many, many years, was intimidating with him as well. And, and it was his first production as a, as a producer. So we were both on our first thing, you know, my first album, his first album, really, as a producer. And, you know, we were both wanting it to be good. So I think, you know, I think some of his decisions or his... Um, you know his his own anxieties of wanting it to be good kind of overrode my own, yeah. and uh, it was hard for me to you know I feel like I lost control a little bit of something that I wish I had a little bit more control of, but I'm still not um, displeased with the result. Um, and I'm wondering because you're I think you're most known for or described as like a top session musician, mm -hmm. but you have recorded um, a bunch of solo albums. Three, three or, now. Three, three solo now. Albums. I'm working on the fourth. So when you did Corporate World and your experience was like, you know, a little disappointing, mm. um, did that kind of deter you from pursuing a solo career? It did, it did for a minute. It did for, I, had, I had some new songs I was working on. And I was, luckily I had a very great, a great solicitor in London uh, at the time who, when I, and I didn't even realize it, but he did a genius thing <laughs> somehow in that lawyer way. Uh, with my contract with Warner Brothers and, and basically I had already the second album I had delivered the songs but they they were concentrating on the sing well we need a single there's not quite what you know it was that single thing was going on again and also they uh, there, no there was something uh, yeah and they were you know they weren't crazy maybe about all of the songs or whatever uh, and I could write more if I wanted, but I had delivered them a record technically. So apparently there was something in the contract that said if the record was delivered, it didn't say they had to like it or not or something. Oh. And so somehow I got paid for the record anyway, oh, <laughs> and then I amazing. left. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I took a year off and I moved to Amsterdam and I just started writing again, like, like just writing creative writing and also working on some more music and decided that after I did that, I was just going to be, I was sick of record companies. I was just going to go and play for other people, which I love doing, because I then get to play all kinds of music, so I don't have to shrink myself down into just my own thing or just some, something that someone else wants me to, to, to be. And um, so I, and uh, while I was in Amsterdam, my manager was on holiday or something, and he called me up and he said, I just was on a beach with Chris Blackwell, who is the 
was at the time the owner and founder and president of Island Records, mm -hmm. Chris Blackwell, who did all the Grace Jones records, by oh. the way, and all the, all the Bob Marley and Sly and Robbie and the sort of Jamaican Bahama thing. Uh, yeah, okay. oh, Bahamas was where they were. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Compass Point. Anyway, it, they had a conversation, and Chris Blackwell was one of the people that was in the bidding war when I signed my first record deal. So there was Island, there was Warner Brothers, and there was Chrysalis, or some of them. I don't, can't remember what other labels there were. So he asked my manager, what's she up to? And he said, oh, well, she's, she's free. So he said, no way. I'd love to do a record. So then I, so then I got pulled back into the fray yeah. to do my second album with Island Records, with Chris, who just was like, "I love what you do. Just go, just go do it, and um, and we'll, you know, you know, we'll see. Yeah. Just go do your thing. You know, he'll check in every now. He was kind of the executive producer, but he let me pick my my team and just get to work. And I really enjoyed that. And I think that. My performance, my, certainly my vocal performance, and I think also some of the songs on the second album, I think are really, really great. I don't like the way the record sounds particularly, but uh, like sonically, that is. Yeah. Uh, but <clears throat> I think I got to make a great record. But the sad part about that was that, again, record company world, Island got sold to Polydor, and then so-and-so changed hands here, and then Chris was off somewhere because he wasn't the owner anymore, and he mm -hmm. kind of came around a few times, but then disappeared, and then when I needed him, he wasn't there. You know, it was just all these weird <laughs> record company things, you know? And I just thought, so the record didn't really get a proper release. It was made, and then they kind of released it, and they let me go. And I was fine with that, because I was like, OK, I only did that because I could. And someone said, oh, come out and do that. And then I knew for sure, I was like, no more record companies. And if I do make a record, I'd have to do it on my own. And then I just was session from here on in, just playing for other artists. And then the joy of that, I'll just go quickly to kind of ties into that, is that then after that, like years later, comes Ani DeFranco, yeah. who out of nowhere, co to me, was the first person to really revolutionize the fact that male, female, whatever, you can make your own freaking record and do it yourself if you know how to do it. And it's not hard to get into a studio and record something and, you know, and just get out there and do it. Yeah. You know, just play and, and, and own it yourself. Like, you don't have to have a record label, and she was the living proof of that. So from that point on, which and, and what she started, I think, really grew and grew and grew until now you've got the internet, you can do all these, yeah. you know, you have a, a bunch of things you can do to, to just do it yourself. So then I made my third album on my own because I knew I could, and that was already 10 years ago or 13 years ago mm -hmm. or something. So I'm working on another one now. I know it's been oh, a long okay. time, but I've been busy. Yeah, I've been busy with <laughs> other artists, which has been wonderful. Um, so you were in London for twelve years, and then what was the what was the catalyst that made you decide to move back to the states? And I read that you lived in an artist colony in Woodstock. Is that, <laughs> is that true? I'd never well, it's not that. really an artist colony, but art, I would say I'm, Woodstock in itself is an artist colony oh, okay, in so a it way. Wasn't some, mm -mm, okay. No, I wasn't living in a commune so they just or anything. Mean yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I met Sarah Lee, who is an incredible bass player, who you should probably also talk to about uh, music. Uh, well, yeah, she was one of the few that was around earlier as well, Sarah Lee, We're just playing with Gang of Four. Right. and uh, Well, she's my best friend. And Sarah, yeah. and she lives in, in the Woodstock area as well. And Sarah, I met her, uh, Louise Goffin, the, the um, daughter of, the first child of Carole King and, and Jerry Goffin, was one of my best friends in London. She was living in London at the same time I was. Mm -hmm. And we hooked up, and we were, we were just really close friends, and we'd hang out, we'd write songs. We had a band together once, and, and when I was working with Brian Ferry and he needed some cool thing for a video, excuse me, I got Louise in, and so we did this, we went and toured with Brian Ferry together. We were just really, really good buddies, mm -hmm. you know. And she knew Sarah Lee from New York City days or something. And I'd never met Sarah. She used to talk to me about, you got to meet my friend Sarah, you know. I said, well, I'd love to meet her. And she's with the Indigo Girls, and she played with a Gang of Four and all these people. And I said, well, I know her work, but I've never met her. I don't know why we never crossed paths. But she was in New York when I was living in London. Yeah. So 
one night, the Indigo Girls came to Town and Country in London. Town, uh, it's a venue in London. And Louise called me at about 7 o'clock at night and said, Indigo Girls are here. What are you doing? You want to go down? I can get a ticket. You can meet Sarah. You can come see. And I was like, yeah, let's go. So I meet, I go meet Louise. We go down to Town and Country. And I met Sarah. And Sarah and I hit it off. And I met all the, the Emily and Amy and Emily and just kind of Jerry, all the, the cool band. A lot of them all live in Woodstock. Yeah. And so I became friends with Sarah and I went to visit in Woodstock where she was living and, and, and saw that there were all these musicians that were living in Woodstock that were like the coolest like musicians from everywhere, you know, mm -hmm. from session players like Tony Levin, like all these really heavy duty kind of musicians were living up there. And I, at the time in London, was getting weird. The, the government was changing. It was the recession, one, one of many recessions or depressions or whatever the hell you want to call them, it was, was on its way. And work was getting kind of slim in London. And I was thinking, and I was working a little bit more in the States. I was working with Tears for Fears, and they liked working in L.A. So I was in L.A. a lot, and we'd be in New York a little bit, and I was, we were touring in the U.S. And I was thinking, I'm working a little bit more in the U.S. than normal. Maybe I should go back. And, and also, it was just getting awfully expensive in London. I think if it wasn't quite so expensive, I might have stayed. But it was getting like, just, it still is like really, really expensive to live there. And, and just work was not as, as fluent. So as I had met people in New York, and I knew I love New York because I'm a, I, I, lo I like California, but not really, and I'm a, and I like the seasons, and I don't like summer, <laughs> you know. So, so I like you know to be able to have snow and stuff. So I thought, I and I didn't want to live in New York City again because I didn't want to like live in a shoebox, and ju I just couldn't do it. So I decided, well, maybe I'll move up to Woodstock because it's everybody seems to go back and forth to the city, and it's not a problem. And and I'm not in the city, but I'm close to the city, and. I can still have that New York experience. Mm -hmm. So I moved in with Sarah for a while until I found my place where I live now in Kingston. Oh, okay. And uh, and I've been up I've been up there for twenty years now. Wow. Jesus. Yeah, I love it up there. Yeah, just about. And and I, I really really love it. And it is clo it's close to Northampton. It's just a good proximity mm -hmm. to music in the Northeast in general. To be there, and it's it's such, a, and now it's just exploding. I think musically, there's a lot of young people coming up from New York, that are certainly into Kingston, where I live, which is kind of the town. Uh, it, they they're calling Kingston now the upstate Brooklyn, because oh. all the all the all the hip young kids are coming up who can't now afford Brooklyn, yeah. you know, are coming up to a place where they have great old architecture, old buildings, place where they can work. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the sad thing about modern uh, all the uh, you know big cities today is that even and especially new york city is that you know the the sort of gentrification and and the, the money that's pouring into the, like who's buying all these lofts and high rises and things that they're building in these cities and that and the cultural the culture of these cities which are people like me as a little girl <laughs> wanting to be an artist or find a place to create or rehearse in some gar uh, old garage with your band so you, you don't have, there's nowhere to breed this creativity anymore. There's nowhere for young people, young artists, whether they're painters or actors or musicians or whatever, to, to, to play. Mm -hmm. You have to have experience, you know, and that's what's also sad about some of the the, comp the, the competition television things and all those things as well is because there, uh, there's no doubt that a lot of these young people are talented and they can sing, but there's a part of that that you need to kind of play, like you you need to have a space to, to grow in what you're doing in, in many ways. You know, it's one thing to, if you just want to be famous, that's fine, you can go and be famous, but if you want to really be an artist, Sometimes you need a little like you need to get out in the sandbox and pl like you need a place to kind of grow as an artist and and just cities don't allow for that anymore. They don't allow an area where where you know people can be creative. There's no more like Soho's and stuff. You know that kind of stuff is is disappearing. So Kingston has become like a little like and I'm hoping it doesn't 
go over the top, you know. It's like a lot of the young people are coming up and finding a place they can get a cheaper rent and they can can create and do stuff. We have a great O Positive Festival every year now and where, where the, the health care practitioners in the area donate their services to all the artists and musicians who can't afford health care. Oh, and wow. it's a weekend. Amazing. And then the, then the musicians perform for the community for free. So the community buy like a, t well, I mean, like, they don't get paid, they get health care for doing it. And then people donate money by buying a $20 wristband. Mm -hmm. And for a weekend, you can see like 40 different bands all over Kingston in the area. And then the people who sign up to perform get to sign up to say, I need to have a cavity filled or I need to have a, 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 a something, you know, some kind of massage or chiropractic treatment or something, you know, nutrition counseling. Whoever, whatever health care practitioners offer, their services, and that was created in Kingston, where I live, and it's going into its sixth year or seventh year now. Yeah. And uh, I've performed at it as well, and just you know, it's a great. So you know, I'm hoping that other cities will try to you know make a space for people to create again. It's just you know, it's funny that it's kind of like wealthy people, whether whatever they want to move into an area that's cultured and and great and wonderful, and then they move in, and then. No one can afford to be there who's, yeah. who can give them the art and things that they want, that they think they want to have. You know, it's kind of an it's irony. Or they you know? like the idea of the culture, but they don't want yeah, to Yeah, but they don't want to live next to it. Yeah. You know, they sort of, well, we want to own everything, you yeah. know, but we just want you to somehow just be there when we want you. But it doesn't okay, work well, that I way. I can't not talk about David Bowie. Mm -hmm. um, and... So he heard mm. your album, Corporate World, and made a mental note to contact you for a project. Well, no, he told me that it was that he saw me on TV. Oh, okay. And I, was do, I must have been doing something from the corporate world, because that's the only time I've been on TV in the UK. He told me that he was in a hotel once in London, and he was flicking through the channels, and I came on the TV. And I was, he said, you did a song, and then you went and you talked on the couch or whatever, and then you got up and you did another song. And I was probably just doing a song with my guitar player, Steve, Steve Roberts, at the time. And I don't know what I was doing. I don't even know what show it was, and he doesn't either. I can't imagine what it was or what I could possibly have said. <laughs> but I'm grateful that I did. And he just said to, he said, I said to myself, I'd love, that, that woman seems really interesting. I'd love to work with her one day when the, pro when the project is right. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, the genius of Bowie is that I've learned that by working with him is that <clears throat> something else he said, and I paraphrase because I can't remember exactly and I don't want people to think I'm, trying, I'm misquoting something that he may or may not have said, but I, I do know that he said to me at one point, putting a band together was like, you know, because I think, again, it was asking him, why was I in the band? Like, why did you choose yeah. me or whatever? And he said, well, putting a band together is like, you know, a good director casting a movie. If you cast the right actors in the movie, your job is done. That's the art. It's not whether you mold the actors to do something or you get the musicians to play a certain thing. It's just if you're clever enough, to choose just the right things, it will it it takes care of itself. So you have to have the the you know the sort of mental picture of of how that's all going to work. And if you get it right, then you it's easy. Yeah. And I was like, wow, I never thought of that. So he was so he was like you know. And then I look at the bands that I've been in, the incarnations of the bands, and I see. You can see how, that's that's just it's just true. And, and he also is somebody who let everybody in the band do exactly what they do. He never told us particularly what to play unless it was something specific that he wanted or if it was something that we did and he was like, oh, I don't like that. Yeah. But for the most part, you just get left to your own devices. You can make up your own sounds. You can figure out how you want to approach something because he never wanted to do the old songs the, the old way. Mm -hmm. So you were free to be creative with it if you want it to be you know again it goes to that playground thing that's what what was was amazing with him it was like working it was like being an apprentice you know a little 
worker bee under like Michelangelo or something. Like you're learning under like the greatest master of art. One of the, I really truly believe that. And I believed it long before he passed away, but like I always believed that. I just thought this guy is something very, very unique and different and, and just, you know, brilliant. I mean, you might not always like everything. I don't like everything he did, but I, but I would not, I couldn't, I can't deny that just his process and his vision of art and music and film and just his creative, like the just DNA yeah. was something of, of another planet. And also his, his intellect was astute. It was unbelievable what, what he could remember. So then it was no surprise, like after a while, it was no surprise. I was like, well, of course he would remember six years ago something I said on the TV that I don't even remember yeah. being on the TV. You know, it's like, and he would remember, and I, even with all the drugs and stuff, he used to say to me, you know, I'm glad you didn't know me then because I, did, I knew him only his sober life. You know, he said, oh, I'm glad you didn't know me then. I was a bastard. <laughs> no, but he also had a huge sense of humor. So you have to, like, a lot of things were a joke. But he was so clever and like he was so well read and self taught in that like he read all the time. He was always reading. He was reading books and reading and reading and reading and remember and having these facts and figures and and just, you know, just so smart. Yeah. So smart. <laughs> like I don't know, I've never met anybody like him in my life and I've met some very smart people. Yeah, you were quoted as saying, I think it was a Rolling Stone article after he passed away this mm -hmm. year. That he changed, that he altered the course of your life. Absolutely. Just in every Absolutely. way and then, like opportunities. Since Absolutely. Then. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm incredible, I'm incredibly in debt to him. And I just, you know, I just hope I did it enough. But I always made it a point to say to him or to send him in an email just out of the blue or just any time to just to thank him for being a presence in my life and the, and the support that he gave me was just unbelievable yeah. to allow me to share the stage with him in that way he didn't have to do that but he was really he was almost like my mother in a way he had that he was a little bit proud of me and and I even couldn't understand sometimes like I didn't think I was able to be I, I didn't think I was at certainly at the time capable of being David Bowie's bass player He's one of those people like Frank Zappa and stuff who like, if you're in his band, you're like the best, you're yeah. like one of the best musicians in the world. And it's like, he's calling me on the phone. I don't think I, I can live up to that. But he saw that I could. He saw it when I couldn't see it. He would even tell me, he'd be like, you can do that. I'm not even worried. I'd be panicked sometimes. You think, when he asked me to do Under Pressure for the I first time, I was panicked. I thought he was joking because he does yeah. joke a lot. He was, and he gave he's you two a, weeks to learn it. That's right. So he said, two weeks. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and jokingly so, and then just walked out of the room and I just thought, oh my God, the challenges. Yeah. But those are good. Challenges are good. Mm -hmm. You know, they're good. They make you get out of your comfort zone, and he was all about getting everybody out of their comfort zone. Yeah because that's the good zone, really, once you realize that. <laughs> um, so I have a few questions about more like kind of gender questions. Mm -hmm. But first, um, you, did, you said that you like touring or you like playing live. Mm -hmm. um, but then I've also heard that touring is just pretty grueling, no matter how like lavishly you're able to travel. Yeah. And can you talk about your favorite or least favorite aspects of being a working, touring musician? Um, it's only really grueling, I think, now in my late, maybe in, in my later years of doing it. Also, uh, when it's a long stretch, you know, sometimes it, it has been in the past, not, not so much now. With Lenny, we've had a couple of long tours, but for the most, time, most part, we, we work throughout the year we're not always touring but we do private shows and we do different engagements and things and so it's kind of paced at a nice pace mm -hmm. um, but I think I'm just sort of um, I'm a little bit germaphobic and so hotels yeah. <laughs> at some point I don't know when it was it kind of clicked in my head and I just thought I can't I can't sleep in another hotel bed I sleep in a sleeping bag in my 
in the hotel, but I carry a sleeping bag everywhere I go yeah. to sleep in a hotel. I just can't get in the sheet. It could be yeah. like this or the Ritz Carlton or the finest, most amazing hotel in Monte Carlo or whatever. I, whatever. I can't do it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I've seen too much. I've been to too many dives and I just thought, oh my gosh, I just want to be home in my own bed. Yeah. So when, at least when you're in your own sleeping bag, you're in your own you're in your own shit every night, you yeah. know, and it's fine. You know what's going on. You just take you just take the covers off. You lay your own bed out in there, and you go to sleep. And I'm comfortable with that. And you know, sort of wearing yeah. slippers and stuff all the time, and so so you know, worst some things about tour. Seats. Yeah, <laughs> to, yeah, that's the worst part no, about yeah, touring. Yeah, and bad. airports now. It wasn't. It didn't used to be so bad. All the yeah. flying and is a pain in the ass. So it's it's grueling in that sense. It's it's just the it's it's more the, it's not the t again it's not the shows that are tiring, mm -hmm. it's the other stuff. It's yeah. moving from town to town. It's long bus rides and waiting. and waiting around and uh, you know it's it's that lug the lug carrying the luggage or it's it's the it's just, it's the physical part that's becoming mm -hmm. grueling. And I guess it is because of my age and just time. You know, it's I'm not I don't sort of. Uh, bounce back as quickly as possible as I used to. I try and stay fit though, but. Um, and it seems like in your case, your gender has been more of an asset than a hindrance because there mm -hmm. are so few female bass players. Um, what has your experience been as a woman, woman of color, who is a professional, successful working musician? Yeah, you know, I, I think I've been very, very lucky because I haven't had any, um, it seems that my, my color, my race, and my gender have just only worked to my advantage. I think people are just kind of, I don't know, I won't say in awe, because there's nothing to be in awe about from me, but they're just kind of like, wow, she's good. Like, it's yeah. good, like, it's not, like, it's just, I mean, when you said that, I was like, well, there is, because you're really, really, really good. And, they, and I think it's also like, you know, they wait to see, too. They're like, yeah. oh, she's, you know, uh, you know I, w I often have people when you're, you know, when you're in an elevator or something like this, and, and they know there's a band in town, they're like, oh, are you with the band? And, you know, because I don't, you know, look like everybody yeah. in the hotel or whatever. And then, and then, like, are you the singer? Now, I'm always the backing singer. And I go, no, I'm the bass player. <gasps> No way, you know. So then it's like the curiosity. Well, let's see, you know, what you can do. So then when you just get up there and do it, what can they say? You know, there's no, it's like, well, I'm, I'm holding it down. I'm doing my job. So is there a problem? <laughs> you know, so I think it's work, you know, you know, I think it's, it's exciting. I think a lot of people, it has worked to my advantage because Visually, I think it's been good for a lot of the bands that I've been in, and and it it's just it's you know it's an exciting member of the band. It's not your it's not just another man on the bass or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. You just sort of. I had another question mm -hmm. that dealt with the. Are you a singer? Oh, you're a bass player. But you've played with and collaborated with a lot of different musicians. You're a public figure, and you're sought after because of your talent but you maybe don't receive the same recognition as someone who is a lead singer or like a lead guitarist. Mm. And this is probably great in some ways, but maybe not so great when it comes to being remembered as an important figure in rock history, which is like why I'm doing this. Right. So how do you think your experience as a musician differs from women who are fronting bands or in that, or some kind of front person? I think I've I've had a t a, the best of both. Well, maybe not the very best, but I've had a, a, a for a while a really good balance between the two things. And I think I have a, a you know obviously there's been an enormous amount of people that have kind of come over to my camp because of the under pressure with with Bowie. That was a huge exposure to have that. And and when I did my last album, it came out just before that final tour with Bowie, mm -hmm. who said to me hurry up and get it finished so we can sell it at the show. So he was even gracious enough to let me sell it. So I made all my money back just yeah. doing one, sing that song one night and the CDs are sold out by the end of the night. So it was a great help, you know, gesture from him and I appreciate it greatly. Um, but I also, I think I have, 
I still, even from the corporate world days, I still have a base of people who know me as a singer, who, who are fans of my music and uh, as a singer, and they go, oh, well, you, yeah, you play bass with all these people, but I want to hear you sing. Yeah. And this is what I'm feeling now, actually. I get it because now I have more input from social media, which I don't had no other way of connecting with people, and I, and my my pages are just constantly getting more likes or whatever that means or joins or whatever. And I don't even do anything on the page. I don't really have anything. You know, I'm not. Yeah. You know, I try and keep a little bit interest, and I talk about things that mean something to me. And obviously, unfortunately, it's mainly people who are passing away and, uh, and wanting to, people to recognize the work that they leave behind. But um, <clears throat> I think that uh, you know, I think I still have the potential, and I'm and uh, and I'm I'm about to go back into that arena to to be a solo artist as well. Mm -hmm. I think I can. I think I will still have an audience. I'm not saying I'm going to be you know, the next whatever, Joan Armour trading or something, but I think there's enough people there who, who could support me as a solo artist, and, and I would only uh, uh, acquire more people if I start pushing myself in that particular direction, like going out and doing my own shows, doing coffee house, university, I don't care what it is, you know, a stage is a stage to me, I don't care whether it's the stadium we're doing here or it's, you know, the bar over here at the hotel, it's still, it's, they're equally as important. And uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to kind of bring the, tilt the balance because it's been mainly session work for quite a few years now, at least the last decade. So I'm kind of trying to get it more balanced because I don't want to give up the other. I love playing other yeah. people's music. And I think that's what's different from someone who's just a, a, a singer or guitarist, singer, bass player, singer, whatever, who's just doing their own thing. And maybe they occasionally guest star on somebody's record, or they do a little song or duet with someone, but they don't know that world of just of the you know, of work, of the side musician or whatever. Mm -hmm. And there's a there's a whole etiquette to that as well, mm -hmm. and and keeping and being someone that people want to call, that's important. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also been something I, I've learned, and I've you know just learned how to how to get along with people. It's a temperamental, uh, working for lead singers, they're very temperamental. Yeah. And I'd be the same, so, so I appreciate it. So I, uh, knowing it from that side is a good thing for me, because I know when to shut my mouth and just say, okay, that's what you want, this is what you get, because you're, you're the, I'm working for you. And, it's, and I like being a piece of somebody's uh, uh, painting. I want to be a color on the palette, like that's my job, I'm just red. I'm not trying to do the whole thing. I'm going to do the red part, and that's going to be great. And when here's, here comes my part, boom, there's my red. I'm done. Yeah. But that's my part. Like, you know what I mean? And it makes the whole thing. And I think a lot of people, uh, a lot of session players or young people starting out or uh, getting into, the, uh, you know, a job with someone big or something, and they want to do every, you know, they want to say they know better or just think, you know, and it's like, you know, I'm not playing enough or I want to, you know, I can't believe I just have to do this bit right here. And I'm like, but that's your part. Yeah. Your part is brilliant. That's all it is, but that's all, that's all it needs to be to make the whole thing work. It's like they lose sight of the, it's about the whole piece. That's, you know, again, the lesson that Bowie was trying to explain to me. It's like, you get the, each piece does the whole thing. Yeah. You know, you choose the piece and that, that they do their job and that's it. Um, did, well, you mentioned Facebook. Mm. Um, and I noticed that on your Facebook page, uh, you use they, them pronouns. Have you always gravitated toward like gender neutrality? Um, do you identify as women in rock? And what are your thoughts on the category women in rock? Oh, I totally identify with women in rock, for sure. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I just think, you know, women are really the most powerful, the female force in a way is, in, is the most, one of the most, or the most powerful emotional force that there is really in any kind of essence. And you know, in music it's like, it, there are a lot of women now playing music yeah. and it's just great because it's just on all levels from the really poppy stuff to 
you know, the, what's the, the woman, I always say her name wrong, Esperalda, Esperalda. Oh, Spalding? Yeah. Spalding. Yeah. Esperanza. Yes. Esperanza. Spalding. I'm so sorry. I always get it wrong. I haven't seen her play yet, but I've she heard she's in, in town and I missed it. That's, I've heard she's there. amazing. Yeah. And I've seen, I mean, I've seen her on YouTube and things yeah. like that. You know, there's, you know, she's doing something like totally different. And you got the Corinne Bailey Ray, and then you have, you know, you still have your Indigo Girls, and, you know, and you've got Katie Lang doing this incredible thing with, with Nico Case at the moment and Laura mm -hmm. Veer. There's there's so much really nice energy, like female energy, and you know I I I just feel honored to be a part of any of that. Like to just to for, for you to even be here today to ask me to even care about my life, is amazing, you know. I, because I, it, it's um, you know it, for women anywhere the world is a battle. It's a, it's constantly a battlefield, no matter what you're doing, whether you're doing art or not, whether you're just trying to live and, and grow up, you know, the, we, we have it really good here, <laughs> you know, and there are a lot of countries where women are just still like at the bottom, bottom, bottom of the pool. And, you know, so for me, it's an honor and I, I have, I will uphold that, you know, for all women, you know, I have one story, oh, I don't know if I want to, say. <laughs> um, I, I don't want to say who the artist is, but I'll tell you what the story is because I don't want to say something bad. It was, it's an artist that I worked with who was a European artist and he's very, very famous in the country that he his, of his origin. And he had three young women in his band at the time I worked for him who were um, 19, 20, six maybe the oldest, and one was, I don't know, somewhere in the middle there. And they were playing uh, strings in the band, like a sort of string section. Like they were from a conservatory, and so they had never really worked in kind of popular music, but they were in this particular group that I was in. And one, and they were not dressed, you know, you know, they were young girls and they were wearing pretty scantily clad, clad whatever, what's the, whatever the phrase is. The clothes were not, you know, they were sort of. And one night, the singer of this particular band, in the, one of his maybe drunken nights or whatever, I don't know, I don't know what, yeah. what state uh, he was in. It was almost the end of the show. There's maybe one or two songs to go. And he was very excited. And it was, it was 10, 15,000 people in an arena in Europe. He decides he wants to run over to the girls, like slide on his knees, you know, over to these three girls who are standing there with their little violins. And the one girl in the middle, I can't remember where she was standing or whatever. And he grabs her around the waist and he puts his face right in her crotch in front of. 15,000 people, like, you know. Yeah. The look on her face, her horrified little 19-year-old face in front of all those people trying to, like, play her part. When I turned around and saw the look on her face, it was the one and only time in my entire career I took my bass off, I put it down on the stage, and I walked off the fucking stage. Yeah. And everyone on the side of the stage was going, where the hell are you going? What the, you know? And I was like... I will never, as long as I live, be a part of that as a woman standing on this stage, seeing anybody do that to another young girl in, with me. I have nothing to do with that. And I don't care. You can send me home tomorrow. I don't care. I will never, ever, 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 ever be a part of something like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this artist, his argument in the end, he's like, what did you, you know, after the show, I'm sitting in my dressing room, like, I can't believe I saw that. That will never, I won't, I can't do it. I never went back on stage. They finished the show without me. He's like, why'd you go off the stage? You know, Prince does that when he, you know, to his whatever, whatever his argument was. And I said, if Prince does that to a young girl on a stage, she knows it's coming. Yeah. That's different. These girls are just like hired from some classical school or whatever. They're all they're like, oh, I'm excited. I'm playing with this this big European pop star. I won't say whose name it is. And I just thought, 
So, you know, I, you know, in terms of women in this business, there are certainly, there are still so many things that are wrong, and there always will be. But, you know, for me, it's very important that there's always respect and dignity for any other, any women in my area, and, so, and also for myself. I, have, I don't stand for certain things that I think are disrespectful, not only for women, but for men, but especially for women. So I have a big, no, that really gets my, me round. And I don't, you know, I had a bad temper when I was little and I left it behind, but when I see something like that. You know I'm going to YouTube, YouTube this and Google it and find out who that person is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need I'll to tell you off camera. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you off camera. Who is it? Okay, well, we're almost, uh, we're almost finished. I mean, how do you feel about your role in music history? As I feel like you're one of the pioneers and progenitors of wow. women in rock. I mean, I think a lot of people would say that. If it, if that's you know if that's true now, it's it just it just snuck up on me like yeah. it's something I never thought about. I never thought I was trying to like you know I I always thought I was trying to uphold like what we just talked about, just some kind of dignity, you know, like to be somebody who didn't do something just to get a job or just to, you know, be something or have somebody think something of me. I just thought the only thing, the best thing I can do is be really good at what I'm doing. And any other woman that I respect, they were really good at what they were doing. Karen Carpenter, forget about it. One of the greatest singers and drummers ever, yeah. you know, or, you know, or Dionne Warwick or, or Carole King or like these people, these women were excellent at what they did you know and they still they had to face things they had you know they were battered wives and they were this and they were that but they were like you know they were giving you like the best that they could give you you know and that's what I just wanted to uphold as a woman having had the opportunity to do it it's like I don't ever want to go out there and, and not give it everything and I really really appreciate my luck because I know I'm lucky. <laughs> I'm really, really lucky. You know, but someone said something really nice to me the other day, and I, because uh, I was telling him how lucky I felt and how grateful I, how, how amazed, what a miracle to get a phone call from someone like David Bowie one time in your life yeah. out of nowhere. And he said, well, he said, the good thing is that, you know, David Bowie was smart enough to give you the phone call, but it was you that kept you there for 20 years. It wasn't him making the phone, just, you know, he, he was smart enough to call you, but whether you stayed or not was not up to him, it was up to you. Yeah. And I thought, God, I never thought about it that way. But I guess I was, I rose to the occasion, you know, he gave me the, ch the challenge and, and, you know, and was, was, was patient and, and kind and generous and, and was a great mentor just taught me how he taught me how to work a stage he taught me how to dress he taught me how to how to do it how to perform how to be an artist and it's like wow what a what a lucky person I am you know yeah. that I was and, and I'm just grateful I could could rise to the occasion I think you know my mother had something to do with that you know I yeah. think of her all the time I just think you know she believed in me whether she said it or not she believed in me so I, you know I wasn't gonna let her down yeah, she did in the corner of the club. Yeah, she was first. with her first. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, what are you most proud of in your life, personally and or professionally? Oh boy. Well, professionally, I guess I'm most proud of my work with Bowie. Uh, easily said. Um, but also, no, there were so many things. You know, I mean. I really had a great time working with Roland Orzabal from Tears for Fears as well. That was mm -hmm. right prior to Bowie. And I feel like my time with him was very much preparing me for that, which I didn't know at the time. Because he definitely, he took me to that. He was after the Rude Blue album when I was done with making records and being a solo artist. And then he took me to that next level as a session player, yeah. I felt. Because his music is really complex and very meticulous and beautiful I like that he almost like the way I think in a way David's a bit more like you know let it have some rough edges and you know be but Roland was like tch, 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 mechanical I mean he he chose his band by your horoscope he was a horoscope freak what? 
This guy would sit on this giant computer every day and look at the planets. <laughs> and oh, know, wow. you know, so I'm Scorpio with uh, whatever moon. And like, he wants to know your birthday. He wants yeah. to know, you know before he can decide whether this is going to be the right mix of people. <laughs> so, but he got it right, you know, I think. It was a great band we had, really great band. But he was, you know, very, you know, so I... That was another very proud moment, I have to say. I, and I still tell him even, uh, you know, now. I, every now and then I shoot him a message to let him know how, much, how appreciative I am of, his, of having worked with him. It was a wonderful experience. So I'm very proud of that. It was short but sweet. And, um, and Bowie would be, obviously, there's nothing that can really top that. The, th the, la the only thing that does top Bowie, and I have to say, just personally, and it's personally and professionally, and I'll tell you something personally too, is working for Olivia Newton-John. Olivia Newton-John was my childhood yeah. idol beyond, beyond the one of the, to me, the voice of angels. Like if, a, if, if you could hear angels sing, it would sound like her, mm -hmm. in my opinion. What, a, and, and she was gorgeous. And I just was like, I would give anything to play for Olivia Newton-John, anything in the world, but I guess it'll never happen. I remember thinking, and when I met Nathan East, who did my album, Corporate World, he played on Olivia Newton-John records, and I used to say to him, oh, what was she like? You know, like, oh, she's really nice. I'd be like, God, I wish I could be you. I wish I could play on Olivia Newton-John. He's like, well, maybe one day you will. And I was like, nah, it'll never happen. Oh, wait, so it never happened? It did. Oh, okay. I'm like, yeah, no, he was saying it'll never happen. No, it did happen. And, it, and to me, that was like, that's the thing personally that I'm yeah. most happy. The, that, that was my is, was, is, was my happiest, happiest, most exciting moment on stage in my entire career. And I don't think anything will ever top it. Wow. I really don't. Just to, to, to go out there and play... 38 songs or whatever of, that I knew like the back of my hand from Magic to Xanadu to I Honestly Love You, uh, Have You Never Been Mellow, Please Mr. Please. I mean, just the greatest songs in pop music. And I'm like, I'm getting to play and there she is. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> I was levitating. I really felt, I was yeah. nervous because there's hardly any film of me. I only did a few shows. I worked with her like a couple just before Lenny. And the, the, the interesting story about Olivia that actually becomes a personal moment that's very amazing, um, I'll try and tell it quickly. When my, the last show I did with Olivia Newton-John was in Adelaide, and we were performing at a gay festival, some kind of a gay two-day festival, and we had the Adelaide Symphony Orchestra behind us, which was amazing. So I had a full orchestra, so you could get all those 60s and 70s pop tunes in, just as they were done on record with all the strings and everything, and she's singing like, like she's 17 years old, and it's just amazing. And just before, prior to that, we'd spent one whole week in a, a place called Gaia that Olivia owns with a childhood friend of hers, a gay man that she's known since they were teenagers or something. And, they, and it's, it's about 30 minutes from where she lives, her Australian house. She treated whoever wanted to come in the band to a whole week at Gaia, which is a spa. It's like a Condé Nast spa, one of the top 25 spas in the world, where you go as a retreat and you have organic food that's grown and thing. The men are wearing skirts and it's like, you know, it's like you have a little bungalow, you get a massage, there's a big Buddha on the mountain. You know, it's, it's like the classic place, right? And so she was like, look, whoever wants to come to Gaia for a week, you can go and stay at Gaia. And I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll go. So I go to Gaia and I have a whole week at Gaia. She lives about 30 minutes away. <clears throat> One night she comes in, takes us out to her house. We make pasta, sit around on the porch, you know. Her friend comes by, we hang out, you know, drink a little wine, sing some songs around the kitchen table. Uh, uh, and then, you know, do your, uh, she'd come to Gaia at seven in the morning and I'd be taking yoga class next to Livy, so we'd be doing our downtime. I'm like, <laughs> Oh my God! So and it was just the, the most blissful week, and also a week for me to have some. I hardly have a quiet week, you know, no internet, and 
And I would go and sit up. There was, was a Buddha up on a mountain where you could get this great 360 view. And I'd go up there and I'd just sit and I was thinking about my mother because she asked, she used to, she's very spiritual. And she asked a really interesting question at the dinner table that night at her house. And she said, she went around the table, so two or three other band members were with me. And she said, what are you most afraid of? Just tell us really quick, like, oh, don't think about it. Like, what, is, what right now in your head, like, that you think about every day or something that's bugging you? What are you most afraid of? And she'd often say things like that. And you'd be like, oh, deep. And I said, what came out was, my mother. And I was like, she's like, what are you afraid of about your mother? And I said, well, she's getting old, and I'm not around. Like, I don't have enough time to be there. To, I go as often as I can to Philly to take care of her and take her out. And, and I'm worried she's on her own and something will have to be done soon because it just can't, you know, she's good. She's almost 90, but she, and she's living on her own and still getting up and down the stairs and going to the market. But she's tired, I can tell, you know. So it worries me. That was my worry at the dinner table. So when I leave Adelaide after a, a wonderful week at Gaia, kind of meditating on that and thinking, what am I going to do about my mom being sad about it, having a, you know, really being concerned what's going to happen next. I come home, and the day I land from, from the, after the Adelaide show, my last show with Livy, I landed Newark or JFK or something, and I had a phone message from my brother, who I don't speak to very often. I have a, my younger brother's Jehovah Witness, and he's kind of weird, so I don't speak to him very often. But, so I had a message from him. I thought, something must be wrong. <laughs> and he goes, Ruby, which we called my mother by her first name, I never called her mom, was Ruby. Everybody in the street called her Ruby. She was always Ruby. Ruby's in the hospital. And I was like, oh my God, I just landed at JFK. So I said, well, I've just, I'm waiting for my luggage at the carousel. I'll get my stuff, I'll go home, I'll get in the car, I'll be in Philly in the morning. Mm -hmm. So I go down to Philly, and she's in the hospital, and she had like a blood clot or something in her leg. And she was just tired. She couldn't get up. We'd given her one of those bracelets, so she was good to go. She pressed the thing. The neighbor came, took her to the hospital. And she was, she was still speaking and, you know, coherent and, you know, wanted her hairbrush. And, you know, she was sitting up in the bed, and she's like, ah. Oh. And I was like, oh, okay, well, we have to, you know, we're going to have to figure out something. So they take her for an X-ray, and they find out she's riddled with cancer. But she had no symptoms, no pain, no, she had no idea. We're not, she was kind of like me, she never went to the doctor, she didn't have any ailments. She had one pill she took for her blood pressure yeah. for, for years. But they found tumors everywhere and the doctors were baffled because they were like, anyone else who'd had this, they would be sick, they'd be yeah. this, they'd be that, but she didn't know. She was just living her life. Very odd, right? The day it was, this is the last part of the story. The day she did pass away in 10 days after that, quietly, peacefully, no pain, no painkillers, no nothing on her. I was holding her hand when she went to sleep. It was awesome. But I was prepared for that by being at Gaia for that week. It was so strange. So Olivia will always have even a deeper meaning for me. I explained that to her after it happened. because so I was like, we had this conversation at the kitchen table. And, you know, two weeks later, I don't have to worry about that anymore. And when I, it was so weird, I had jury duty, which I didn't, <laughs> so weird. I got called for jury duty, and I, I had to go home to at least appear to say, my mother's sick in hospital and I have to go back to Philly. So I go home just for like one day to the jury duty, and, they, and I get up to the judge and say, my mother has cancer. And before I could finish, she was like, get out of here. So I was like, so I leave. But I called my mother on the phone. This is the last part of the story. It's kind of a tearjerker, but I called my mother on the phone at the hospital just as, each day to see how she was doing. And she was getting a little bit more just delete, like she could still speak, but she was kind of just, you know, eventually in the end she just didn't talk anymore for like about four or five days, not a word. She was just silent, just sleeping and just quiet. And she was still speaking and some I called her on the phone and uh, to see how she's doing. I said, I'm going to be back tomorrow. You're okay. I'm good. And then someone came into the, to the room, two friends from her church, from her Baptist church, walk into the room. And they 
I hear them on the phone. Hey, Ruby, how you doing? She's like, hey, you know, and then she's like, okay, uh, bye, you know, and I was like, okay. But she didn't hang the phone up. It was weird. I don't know if she, you know, and I, and so I hear her, fr and I, ca I just sat there on my desk on the phone, and I just waited for her to hang the phone up, and I could still hear them talking in the room. And her friends uh, were saying, they speak, it was about half an hour I was on the phone. Her friends would talk to her, how you doing? Well, and she would try and explain what was wrong. And then, then every 10 minutes or so, her friends would say, who's on the phone, Ruby? And she'd say, my daughter's on the phone. And she, they'd go, oh, okay. You know, and then they'd leave it, and then she'd start talking about something else, and then they'd go, is somebody on the phone, Ruby? <laughs> and she'd go, my daughter's on the phone. And then she went, she just came back from Australia. She was playing with Olivia Newton-John. <laughs> And that was the moment yeah. I knew she was proud of me, yeah. of my whole life. It was something in her voice that I got to hear that on the phone. I, to this day, I was like, oh my God, I lost it. It was just something in the way she said those, that word. And if I hadn't stayed on the phone, I wouldn't have heard it. But it was like, I got to hear that just before she passed away. And those words, Olivia Newton-John, because she knew me as a, you know, I'm her daughter how many hours I would spend in my room listening to Olivia Newton-John. How important that was for me, like hugely important. And she was proud of me. So I knew that. So that's like, that's my biggest personal achievement of all my life, is to know that. Yeah. That's, yep. that's an amazing story. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think that's, unless you have anything else that you want to add, I think... I'm <laughs> sorry, I told to you to be a tearjerker. I'm it's sorry. Right. No, it's okay. <laughs> no, that... That's yeah, true, I, though. I think that's it, and I thank you so much for doing this. Oh, you're so welcome. You're, you're welcome. I got pleasure. plenty of time. I'll be good. Oh. Okay. You're Thanks so welcome. Thanks for including me. I just w I was saying to, yeah, if you want to talk to Sarah Lee, she'd be happy. I was saying to Sarah, yeah, I said, we how amazing that... They've asked me to be part of something that I think is so important. It's great what you're doing. Because it's yeah. true. It's like there has to be some kind of documentation of the progress of women in mm -hmm. music and art or whatever it is. It's just, it's important. No, and I'm really and focusing on women who aren't necessarily like the figureheads. I want the yeah. bass players and the drummers. Yeah. I'm kind of like seeking. Exactly. Because <laughs> there's a whole network of that too, yeah. you know, and that's true. People don't think of that as like the, the uh, you know, it's like either you're a famous female artist or whatever. It's like, but, you know, there's a whole support system under every entertainment genre, yeah. from film to music to painting to, you know, the gallery owners. You know, it's like women, you know, hold a really strong position in those places and stronger and stronger. And, it's, and what you're doing just makes it better because yeah. that's another thing where someone might see that. Like I saw Anna Nancy Wilson on the Midnight Special and go, yeah. I can do that now. Look at all these women who did that, 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 and that. So God bless you. I told someone the other day that I'm basically doing this whole project because I, it's something that I really wish it existed when I was like 13 and there you playing go. guitar. And, there you go. You know, there it, you it was go. just really hard to find any information. Exactly, about exactly. Any women that exactly. Were to, so now I have like a whole database. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. One, well, that's good. That people can use, yeah. Good. It's basically my fourteen-year-old dream. Wonderful. <laughs> well, yeah. there you go. We like we like that. We like dreams coming true. Yeah.